from Cassopolis, Michigan, and streaming across the planet. This is Shane with Futures IO. We're pleased to have you here, and thank you for joining us for our 419th webinar event. Uh, Futures IO is a trading community that is dedicated to transparency and bringing you quality education with webinars such as this. The basic membership is free. Head on over there and sign up when you get a chance. Uh, our guests today need no introduction in the futures community, but I'm going to do it anyway. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome Dr. Brett Steenbarger and Morad Askar, aka Futures Trader 71. Uh, Dr. Brett is a professor of psychology and behavioral sciences. He began trading equities back in the late 70s and started coaching prop traders in 2004. Uh, since then, he's worked in that capacity with a variety of investment banks, hedge funds, and money management firms over the years. He's also written five books on trading psychology and authors the Trader Feed blog and the Three Minute Trading Coach on YouTube. And Morad started as a high frequency NASDAQ equities day trader back in 2000. In 2009, he began to popularize the concepts of volume profiling as a way of trading based on market narrative. And these days he's the founder of Convergent Trading, which specializes in supporting traders that are serious about their craft and want to take it to the next level, as well as opening EdgeClear, which is an independent futures brokerage. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A session. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box. And if we don't get to yours, uh, it'll be posted over at the Futures IO uh, in the webinar thread. And as always, this event is being recorded and it will be posted over at Futures IO uh, on the website and on YouTube within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, speaking of YouTube, our channel has over 400 videos covering just about any trading topic you can think of, including uh, numerous videos from both of our guests. Uh, check it out, smash a few like buttons and share it with your friends and definitely subscribe for all the latest updates. Finally, on social media, you can follow us on Facebook and also on Twitter at Futures IO. And now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brett Steenbarger and Morad Asgar. Gentlemen, how's it going? Very good. Thank you. Thanks for, Thanks that. for having us on. Great. I think we're really looking forward to getting this thing going finally, right? <laughs> it's been a process. It's been six uh, months in the making. Yeah. <laughs> Today felt like six months getting it going. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have in terms of uh, questions? Yeah, sure. Well, we can start off right there. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard's got a question. He's, he's asking, what it, what's it like to trade size in the ES? Uh, for example, uh, you know, how is trading 50 to 100 cars different from trading 5 to 10? And how does one prepare for trading size? Uh, yeah um in the es although it's gotten thinner um in the last two and a half years or so it's about 100 to 300 up at each level uh i would say the rule of thumb is you know 50 to 100 uh shouldn't be an issue but the thing that uh guys who start to trade size have to take into account is you cannot be attached to getting filled at one price. Um, you, you're, you're trading in zones. So one of the things I see a lot is somebody who's trading a, a, a small size lot, 10 or less, uh, there's a tendency to say, well, I got to get this price and that's the only price that I want. And when you up your size, it's going to be difficult getting all of them unless you're lifting the market and there's, uh, you know, to, to get long or hitting the bid to, to get short. And there's plenty there, you know, three, 400. Uh, generally, you're not going to get filled all at once. It'll nibble at you uh, very often. And oftentimes, if you wanted 100 at, you know, uh, whatever it is, 39.80, if you wanted 100 at 39.80, then you probably still want 30 at 39.81, you still want 10 at 39.82. It shouldn't make that huge a difference when you're upping your size because when you're trading that size, you're not going for two, three ticks in general, at least not these days. It used to be a game, but mm -hmm. uh, that's tough to do these days. So size overall, the, 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 biggest, the biggest issue with, with going up in size for most people is um, is just confidence in the bigger picture. 
not getting caught up in the tick drama and just simply knowing that, hey, I'm, I'm getting long here. I'm looking to get long in the 39.42 to 39.36 zone. And I'm looking to scale out at 39.54, but my target is 39.70, something like that. You just can't be too attached to getting everything at one price uh, when you're up your size. And there's a lot that goes into upping your size. Uh, obviously, uh, there's more risk and it's not suitable for all investors. But uh, that's the key thing to contend with is that you have to do a little bit more jockeying to get a bigger size filled. Okay, yeah, maybe I could jump in with some other observations. That's excellent, Warren. Uh, you know, I think really focusing on your size works as well in trading as it does in the bedroom. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, you know, the, the whole idea of trading is we have to be immersed in what we're doing. We have to be focused on the process of what we're doing. And so what happens is it, it's not that uh, traders are, should be at one size or another size. It's what is the right process from going from one size to the next size? Because you don't want to put such a magnifying glass on your p &L and the variability, the volatility of your p &L, that that's going to be disruptive emotionally. As it happens, the latest three minute trading coach video that I've done on uh, my YouTube channel tackles this exact topic. And so uh, if you uh, go and Google the three minute trading coach, you'll see that video right at the top of the list. That's a, a free resource. But the idea here is first, you build your consistency of trading. And when you're consistent and when you're profitable, then you move to the next size level. And at that next size level, you work on being consistent and being profitable. And then you go to the next size level. You make it a sustainable process. If you're jumping size so much that it feels totally different and the movement of PL, as Brian is saying, the movement of PL feels totally different. That's going to be disruptive and har potentially harm your trading psychology. Yeah, I equate it to uh, just to, just to add, I equate it to lifting weights. Uh, just because you're all of a sudden feeling a little stronger, you know, you had good sleep and so on. You don't get to a to a, to the gym and decide to bench press what the next guy's bench pressing at 350 pounds, you'll get crushed very quickly. Uh, trading size is an incremental process and it is a process and it's key to, to stay rooted in what it is you're looking for, how it is you're defining risk, how it is you're managing that risk, your trade management um, tactics. You know, once I'm in, I'm, 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 once I'm in, I'm throwing out these limit orders for the scale out or whatever it is. That needs to be like walking or breathing or driving or whatever. It needs to be somewhat subconscious so that you can stay, the focus stays on what the market is telling you as it's ebbing and flowing. So uh, trading size is not a function of, most people think, hey, I'm doing great with a three lot, let me go to 18 because I feel like my confidence is big enough for 18. It is not. Um, it's, it's, it, you really, you're, you, you build confidence, but you're still coming up in a very controlled, like almost like a dosing process of a drug or something. You still, even though you're getting stronger, you want to keep that under control and you want to, they're going to be plateaus. Each one of my prop traders hit a plateau. There's a point uh, I call it, I forget the name I gave it, but there's a point where the psychology and the risk, like the amount of risk someone takes, those cross and you plateau for a while and you find traders have a really hard time getting beyond a certain size. Uh, and then they have to kind of re rethink their process before they can continue again. It's a lot like dieting or lifting weights or 
uh, becoming a distance runner, there's a point where you just have to stick for a while before you take off. It is about the process. Mm. Uh, one last point here, and uh, I, I totally agree with you, Brad. Uh, many of the portfolio managers I work with, because much of the work I do is at hedge funds, they are getting bigger by getting broader. In other words, they don't just get bigger by going from 10 lots to 30 lots, let's say. They get bigger by seeing an opportunity in the ES, and then they see a different opportunity in oil. And then they see another opportunity on the yield curve. Maybe it's steepening. So they have several different ideas on different time frames, which diversifies their trading. They're taking more overall risk, but they're diversifying that risk so that if some ideas don't work out, others will, which smooths their equity curve, smooths their growth. That you know, it depends on how you trade, the time frame you trade. But many times for folks who are holding positions longer, you can get bigger by being broader. Hey guys, I'm going to try something real quick here. See if we can uh, get us looking a little bit bigger on the screen. Ah, there we go. There oh, we're we getting go. bigger. Hey. We're, we're increasing our size. This is good. <laughs> All right, yeah. Are we confident to do this? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I can feel the testosterone already, man. <laughs> All right, we got another question. Uh, Victor would like to know if you can offer any tips or techniques to help get over the desire to move the stop to break even. He says it usually happens after a few losses and trying to avert more losses. So he moves the stop to break even, gets stopped out, and then undoubtedly uh, that's when price runs to the target. Uh, he knows it's a mental block and is asking if there's any tips you could offer to overcome this. Uh, Murad, you want to start? Doc, this is right up your alley. Oh, <laughs> this is... Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and, I mean, obviously we could have fear of losing. We could have fear of losing profit that we've made. And in general, setting stops artificially tight creates a lot of frustrations uh, mm. for trader, for traders. Now, there is a point, and again, this depends on your holding period, there is a point at which moving a stop can be appropriate. In other words, if it really has gone your way, I'll give you a good example, the ES today. You guys follow the ES today? I mean, we, we had a nice pop at the open. You know, their uh, stocks are trading on upticks. Uh, we had tried to sell off, tried to sell off. There was a lot of hitting of bids. If you look at the Delta measure and boom, we start to go up. And so I ended up buying early in the session and it goes up and, and it's doing well into the late morning and into the early afternoon. There is, so it's been a good trade. There is no way on earth I'm going to let that become a loser given the time frame and style that I trade. So in that situation, it does make sense to me to have some trailing uh, stop on PL. That isn't necessarily a, lo a lack of confidence. The question is what is the statistical probability of your stop getting hit by random price movement? And you can't move your stop so close out of fear of losing that just pure noise, expectable noise, We'll take you out of the trade. Mm. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I've done a couple talks on this uh, with uh, Futures IO, and I, I created this statistical model that's called the, that looks at the harmonic rotations within a certain time frame. So, my time frame for the studies that I do, because I'm day trading, I use a one minute time frame. That's not the time frame I trade off of. I'm looking at the big picture, the narrative. I'm looking at the underlying market indices like tick and breadth and things like that. But I know that, for example, based on Sunday night's homework, that the current statistical rotation, what is, what is normal for the ES is up to four and a quarter points in the ES. That's 17 ticks that the ES can statistically ebb and flow and remain within one standard deviation of, of the norm. So what does that tell me? What, what does that mumbo jumbo mean? It means that if I get into a trade and I watch it go up two and a half points and then I move my stop to break even, 
I am dead nut center of what is the normal ebb and flow. So all I'm asking for here is to pay my broker and the exchange and the clearing firms a bunch of commissions for nothing. I have gained zero for my risk which means that I have to keep my stop outside of this noise because as soon as it gets outside of four and a quarter points, it is in the second standard deviation. So the probability becomes around four and a half percent in total um, that that stop would get hit on any given large data set. On this particular trade, on the very next trade at the heart right edge, the probability that my stop will get hit is just always 50-50. It's either gonna get hit or not, I don't know. But in the big data set and a large enough data set, and I'm talking 800, 900 rotations studied in this, uh, which is substantial, I have to keep my stop far away. How far away, and that's a struggle for a lot of traders, I use structure. The market trends or moves away. It doesn't matter if your time frame, if you're trading off of a 15 minute, a half hour, 60 minute, a tick chart, whatever, 200 volume, it will consolidate break, consolidate, break, and I use those consolidations and you can almost draw a box around them. I covered this in my morning trader bites. Every day I draw, I try to remember to draw these boxes to show this is a zone of a fight. The market repriced higher and created another zone than it re I try to stay on the other side of those boxes. Why? Because I want to be in a situation where the, mar where the people moving adversely against you, like uh, Dr. Steenbarger says, a random move, an adverse move against you, I would like them to work through all of that volume there, all of that stuff that happened, that consolidation. I want them to work through that to come and get me. And if they come and get me, it, I'm good with it. What I don't want is for it to move in my direction, but I move my stop to, to where I'm thinking, it moved four points. Let me just grab two points or at least guarantee myself two points. And I cut myself out of a 20 point move. And that's a very common amateur kind of uh, problem. And it creates the need to ignore your risk plan. It creates the, it creates unusual behavior in traders in that, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't move my uh, stop last time screw it, I'm just going to go without a stop this time. And that just happens to be the one time where you get hammered. So just they're incorporating statistics with understanding market movement and what it's looking to do. I feel that combination is really, a, there's a billion ways to trade the market, but I feel like that combination is very strong. Understanding statistically describing the market combined with price action or auction theory or volume profile or whatever you want to use, I think that combination lets you stay outside of that noise and allows you to just sit back, relax, and let the market kind of move your trade uh, with it as it moves. Hmm. Very interesting. Kind of like just relying on your expectancy. If you've got this stuff planned out, then just let it roll. Uh, Shane, Shane, can I add one other geeky perspective on this? Please. I know I'm supposed to be a psychologist, but you know, okay. So John Ellers has done some great work on market cycles. You guys, I'm sure are familiar with that. And so even in a trending market, the odds are awfully good that it's not a trend with a perfect sharp, that there's some cyclicality within the trend. In other words, we have up moves and down moves. And if it's a good trend, then we have higher lows. And if it's a do good downtrend, we have lower highs, but there is this cyclical element along with the trending element. And he has uh, some measures that he has developed, some technical measures that are quite helpful in identifying these cyclical elements. One of them is called the adaptive moving average AMA. It's, he's also called it the MAMA, the mother of all moving averages. Uh, but <laughs> what it does is it's an adaptive moving average. You have a short-term moving average and you have a long-term moving average and you're looking for the crossover of the short-term and the long-term. So that gives you a trend signal, right? The short-term goes above the long-term or vice versa. But here's the key, the duration of the short-term and long-term varies with the dominant market cycle. 
So you have different moving averages for different cyclicality in markets. It turns out that that creates cleaner signals on the moving average crossovers. So if you get a moving average crossover and you're, let's say you're long and you're making a higher low then the previous low from my vantage point is a logical stop out point. Because if you go below the previous low, it's not an uptrend anymore. <laughs> and so that's not random noise. So you use the moving average crossover to give you an entry signal, but you're relying on the previous cyclical low as a point to lean against to say, I'll tolerate noise to that point. And I'll size my position so that if we hit that down previous low, that downside, my account can weather that. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, kind of along the same lines there, uh, Matt brought up a really good point. He said that uh, you both seem to advocate for an evidence-based or a statistical based approach to uh, trading. And he wants to know what you would suggest for a trader experiencing imposter syndrome during a drawdown when trading using an evidence-based approach for broader context and bias development, but more of an intuitive approach to the actual trade triggers. Oof. Yeah, <laughs> it's a really interesting topic. You know, I uh, teach at a medical school in Syracuse, New York, and have for many, many years. And one of the uh, cornerstones of our medical curriculum is what's called evidence-based medicine. In other words, you look at outcome studies and you use the objective outcome studies to figure out which treatments go with which kinds of illnesses and problems. And uh, it turns out that you achieve better outcomes that way. So the idea of evidence-based trading is that you back test some ideas and that you look at what history tells you. Is that a guarantee of good results? Of course not. There can always be idiosyncratic factors in the present, which make the present different from the past. But at least it gives you some basis for believing we've got some good odds of going higher here because of a certain momentum pattern that we've seen. An example I recently talked about is when we have very few stocks making fresh short-term new lows. So I look at one month new lows, three month new lows. When we have very few stocks making new lows, nothing's weak, <laughs> nothing's rolling over. The odds of a continued move higher are quite good. Again, is it a guarantee? No, we could have ha something happen tomorrow, you know, where war breaks out or some ship gets stuck in the Suez. You know. <laughs> a pandemic. <laughs> a pandemic, who the does? But the odds are in your favor that way statistically. So that makes sense. Now, once you know the odds are in your favor, does that rule out intuition? Absolutely not. In other words, you may use intuitive pattern recognition to tell you what's a good point to enter, what's a good risk reward point to enter this trade that has the evidence behind it. And so you may see a breakout pattern on the short time frame that becomes your entry signal and it clicks in your head intuitively. We just broke out. We just made a low and you go with that. But you also know that the evidence is in your favor. Many of the best traders I work with combine the intuitive approach to decision making, which is about pattern recognition with the evidence based, which is about analysis. More add anything to add? Uh, I was so immersed in what Dr. Steen, Steenbarger was saying there and trying to think of uh, examples in my mind that I forgot what the question was. This is uh, evidence-based. Uh, it's about evidence-based uh, trading. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the problem was, uh, you know, they were using that in their trade <laughs> Yeah, and then if you're intuitive, do you feel like an imposter? I think that was the right. question. You know, is there an imposter syndrome because you have a more intuitive approach to decision making? Um, and I and I see them going hand in hand. In other words, I as a psychologist can rely on evidence based treatments. Let's say there's someone I'm seeing who's depressed. I know that cognitive behavioral therapy is the top evidence based approach. 
However, how I use that approach with a particular person may very much depend on my intuitive understanding of what they're ready for, what they're not ready for. Yeah, I, so with, with me, the, the statistical side of things, <clears throat> here's the thing. I started out as a very high volume scalper on it, doing millions of, millions of shares a day on some big issues, Microsoft, Dell, and so on before I moved to futures. And then I started doing about 3000 sides a day in futures and prop. And, and then I had to make the transition to trading with structure. And that was a really terribly difficult transition because I'm, I'm going 100% intuitive like Dr. Steenbarger is talking to now having to rely on indicators and history and looking at charts and things like that. And the way I was able to successfully do that, in my opinion, is that it's so easy to get lost in so many different approaches and so many different ways. For me, in my mind, having an engineering background, it was easier for me to just see a number and just validate it and believe it and go with it. And so it limited what I could test and it limited what I used, whereas Intuition to me, like what I have always told my traders is that intuition is good because intuition is a process that you've thought about and have practiced and done so much. It's become, maybe it's become subconscious that it is still based on things, observable things or quantifiable things. It's just that you've seen it enough that you can now call it intuition. That's what I think. You're the psychologist. But uh, I prefer to lean on numbers and I can feel maybe that today, like today, you know, we open, push straight up through 60 and push through, then pull back to 61 and then run for the rest of the day. I can see that there are no sellers. So my intuition is telling me not to get short. So I've eliminated any setup or any idea that involves taking a short, which frees me up to now focus on where do I get long with reasonable risk for the return that I'm anticipating? You Leaning on statistics like, hey, did we take out the overnight statistic? Did we take the initial balance statistic? These give me solid, quantifiable, high probability targets to go for. But with the imposter syndrome, I, I, I deal with that all the time because as soon as you experience a setback in trading, the biggest thing that comes at you is this imposter feeling of like, was I lucky? <laughs> Do I even know what I'm doing? Oh my God, <laughs> is, is it over? We all feel like, I just feel it. I mean, everybody that I've ever worked with or dealt with, including giant bond traders, bond spreaders, they all get to a point in their career where they're like, man, I don't even know if I knew what I was doing all along. I think I just, I was just lucky. So that's a cycle that we have to go through as traders, but the thing that gets you through it, regardless of what that cycle is and how intense it is, the thing that gets you through it is your process, is your plan, is your notes, is your studies. That's what keeps you on track um, because what happens to most people who come into the business and try to become traders is they experience that and they immediately eliminate their approach uh, or, or uh, conclude that their approach is the, pro is the problem. So now they move on to the next blog or the next chat room. And what they're doing is they're going through that learning curve again and again and again. Uh, they get excited and then they see results and then it crashes. To me, just go back to the process. You've refined this process. Hopefully you've done some homework. Um, and that's how you get past this the rough patches, the imposter syndrome, it all goes back to what are you doing to prepare to research uh, your approach and to understand how to manage your risk versus the rewards. Because at the end of the day, it is your profit factor or your risk return that's keeping you in the game. You know, even if it's random, a random coin toss that has a slight edge to the profit side. Uh, you know, I can flip a fair coin 50-50 outcome on a large data set. But if I can get paid a dollar ten for every dollar I risk, I can stay in the game in the long run after I cover my commissions and costs. So whatever you do, big, big holy grail 
idea. Whatever you do, when you're trading, always try to figure out how you can skew the reward versus the risk on your side. You need about a 1.15, 1.2 to break even given costs. As long as you can skew that, you can almost trade randomly and not saying you're going to make money, but you can still sustainably um, stay in the game. Yeah, excellent. That, that makes a lot of sense for sure. It seems like, um, well, we've got a couple of questions here that kind of fall along those lines. You know, guys, uh, we spend a lot of time preparing and trying to analyze situations and forecast what's going to go on. So you create this grand plan. And then all of a sudden, when it gets down to conducting business, all of it just falls apart because of lack of uh, control, lack of ability to stick to your stops, that sort of thing. Uh, for instance, this re Respez, it says his biggest issue in trading is taking a stop when he's wrong. Uh, how can he become a more gracious loser? That sort of thing. And then also there was another question here that kind of fell into the same line, uh, not taking stops, but uh, uh, Kefir was asking, uh, you know, setting up uh, rules, but uh, always making impulsive trades despite the rules that they've taken the time to set up. Like, in, like say, looking to go long only, but then, you know, sees a potential opportunity for a short and then jumps in on it and, uh, and then crashes and burns, of course, you know. So it seems like these, uh, these types of mistakes cost people a lot of money uh, but they seem to be very difficult to overcome as, in terms of like uh, just an instinctive reaction as opposed to uh, as opposed to sticking to the plan. These reactive types of situations. So any advice for those guys? You're always going to go first, Dr. Steenberger. All right. You want me to go first? <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I look to some of the experience I've had with the developing traders uh, at one of the firms where I work. Some of you are familiar with SMB. And uh, the firm is interesting because they train traders right from the start. And the first place the training begins is in finding where your edge is, that you create what uh, Mike Bellafiore calls a playbook just like a football team that runs certain plays and practices certain plays, you have certain patterns that make sense to you, that you've observed, that you've uh, tested out over time. Uh, and these setups uh, become your bread and butter. And you work on trading those in simulation mode, not putting money at risk. You work on trading those where good inflection points for entry where does it make sense to stop out? All of that is mapped out in these playbooks and practiced in simulation. So that by the time you have money at risk, you've already quote unquote been there, done that. And that is tremendously helpful. Among the developing traders I work most closely with there, they are not going on tilt. They are not ignoring their stops. They are not having this emotional disruption because they've mapped out their trades. They've practiced trading them. They have specific rules for uh, getting in, getting out, that they've mapped over time, that they mentally rehearse, and those become positive habit patterns. And that strikes me as a very sustainable course for development. When people try to put on risk before they've gone through that learning and developing those habits, I think that's when they can find themselves reacting emotionally, getting impulsive and making some of the mistakes that the question refers to. So <clears throat> from my end, the issue with not following the plan and the issue of not holding stops uh, has, through my experience, and again, I'm not a trained psychologist, so this is just based on my observations. It's just, it's based in two things, attachment to an outcome for every single trade, which is just a horrendously volatile and terrible way to trade. Um, and the second, this, the identification of oneself with losses, 
right? Just, I cannot sustain one more loss. I can't stand myself if I lose again. When actually losses are just a part of the process. You just want to make fewer of them and you want to make a lot smaller losses than you do wins. That's how we make money. Uh, and so generally, I call it getting smart in the trade. The issue of not sticking to the plan, people tend to, in my own psychology, and this is covered in a book called The Chimp Paradox, where when, when there's stress available or there's risk available, the, the process is almost shunted. There's a, there's, there's, and I've seen this in myself, like there's something, and I just can't think clearly. I'm sure everyone here has gone through the day has wrecked the day, looked back and gone, oh my God, this thing's gone, done nothing but gone up. How could I not have seen this all day long? And I've been shorting all day. I'm shorting, offered, offered. And you don't see it until you're back into this calm state and you're objective about what you're seeing in front of you. And that goes away. So here's the thing. If you're inconsistent, it is really important to put down what the process is and to just not touch the mouse. Set your brackets, whatever they are, and just leave it alone because any action you'll take will be done from a, from a lens that is about as clear as a pinhole. It's not a panoramic view on the market. You're in a position where you're just defending your PL. A lot of this is driven by people keeping their PL on the screen. That is just mm. like this driver for action. Oh my God, my PL, you know. It's not about your PL. Don't trade for PL. I know that sounds paradoxical, like I'm here to make money. Actually, you're here to refine the process, to, to figure out your edge, and to trade it so meticulously well that it almost has no choice but to pay, right? So as long as there's an edge there. So that's what you should be focused on. You're not focusing on making money. And that's why at SMB is as Dr. Steenbarger talks about, it's about creating your setups and doing it in SIM. The idea there is the refinement process of your edge, because when you do go live, that's what you're doing. You're not sitting here going, I'm not going to go for this setup because I don't think it'll work. I'll go for this other setup because I think you have no idea what you're talking about because it's the market that determines the outcome of your trade. It's nothing else. It's the market. It takes one participant to knock your stop off. So you cannot plan on that. So you interfering with the trade that you had done homework on and set up is just you getting smart in the middle of a trade. It's monkey trade. I call it monkey trading. It's just like flinging poop at the wall, that sort of behavior. It's not really conducive to growth or to stability in your trading. And so it's really important to understand that you're here to execute meticulously. So the focus for everybody listening is deliberate, focused practice on execution. And you want to know what really wrecks people is errors. If you start monitoring your errors, which is something we are very big on, accountability, which is something that you get at a prop shop that you don't get as an individual at home, you don't get the same accountability. Um, so you're, you're not incentivized to just follow the plan. You can just go off on a tangent and then tracking your errors and what they cost. It is crazy how much FOMO costs you, how much shorting when really your plan says long costs you, how much somebody interfering with your own ideas costs you. Hey, I just saw Dr. Steenbarger say, hey, this looks strong today. I think I'm going to get long. And your plan says, I'm going to get short all day. And then all of a sudden, you're trying to get long. That's an error. That's not, he may be on an hourly time frame and you're scalping. You don't, you may both win or lose. So why are you listening to someone else, uh, someone else's plan? You've got to stay in your lane and focus on perfect execution. And that's what we're after in, in prop is, perfect execution. Just doing what you need to do when you need to do it, no questions asked, and let the results speak for themselves. Because then you can troubleshoot and fine tune and so on your edge. But if you're doing random stuff, good luck figuring out what isn't working because it's random, right? So get rid of the PL, 
forget about making money, get really good at trading, period, at executing that plan. Totally agree, Murad. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, ask you guys a question, uh, Shane and Murad. You know, I teach at a medical school. I work with people in the Department of Surgery. What advice would you give a surgeon who goes on tilt? <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, but you see the ra point. Raise your malpractice insurance coverage. <laughs> <laughs> malpractice insurance coverage and <laughs> get the F out of the surgical room. Uh, right. You don't belong in the OR. Uh, but surgery is a performance field, just like trading is a performance field. Why don't surgeons go on tilt more often? You know, why don't they, you know, get caught up in what they're doing? It's because of what you said, Maura, that they've practiced so many times. They've observed many, many surgeries. They practice making cuts, you know, with models, cadavers, etc. They're doing so much practice that by the time they go live, they have a lot of muscle memory. They have a lot of automatic patterns that they've learned. And you want the same to be true in trading. You want to practice, practice, practice to the point where these things become more or less automatic. And boring. So I, I'll turn around and ask you a question, uh, Dr. Yeah. Steenbarger. What if in front of that surgeon, there's a huge display and with every move they make, their payment, their insurance payment or compensation changes slightly with every little thing they do. How will their behavior change as a professional in their field? Should it even change? Right. And obviously, if you're evidence-based, it would not change. But it clearly, that's a good example. That would be quite a distraction because the surgeon needs to be focused on the procedure itself. Process. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And they've got to be in the zone when focusing on what they're doing and how they're doing it. They can't be looking at what the uh, insurance payment will be or whether this is going to be a tremendously successful surgery or a somewhat successful surgery. That, that's not their focus. Right, right, exactly. Very interesting. Um, and so kind of along that same line, we've got a question here that I thought was uh, very interesting applicable but zoom seems to like to move stuff around on me <laughs> sick yeah these questions don't seem to be in a, like a chronological order or anything they just seem to pop up yeah i think what's happening is uh, they're getting upvoted or you know moved around that sort of thing so as somebody gets more votes on the question it pops it up got there, it. So you're gonna ask you're gonna ask this one next got it no I'm, I'm gonna ask the i'm gonna ask the one i want to uh wait stop that all right uh we were talking about the deliberate practice earlier, you know, and uh, one of the questions that Matthew had was uh, what techniques uh, would you guys offer uh, that you use for deliberate practice consistently? And then also on uh, Dr. Brett's end, uh, what deliberate practices do you see pretty much across the board coming from your elite performers that you work with? Yeah, the deliberate practice will depend upon what you trade and how you trade to some degree. Uh, it, you know, if you are a macro investor at a hedge fund, uh, the practice is going to be different than if you're a, a short term day trader. So, so some of the specifics of deliberate practice will uh, be different. But the, the key idea with deliberate practice is that you are always keeping score. So, uh, for example, I, I mentioned the work at SMB. There is a uh, program that they use called TraderView, T-R-A-D-E-R-V-U-E, which captures statistics on your trading. How many winning trades did you have? How many losing trades? What was the average size of winning trades, average size of losing trades? How much money do you make at certain times of day as a function of time of day? How much money do you make on your larger trades versus your smaller trades? How much do you make in this market versus that market? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It slices and dices so that you can see immediately what you're doing right, what you're doing well, like which setups are making the most money. The program will tell you that. So I can do more of what's right. I can set a goal to expand upon my edge to do more of what's working. And I can set goals to say, all right, I need to improve 
maybe by not doing these setups, or maybe uh, I'll give a personal example. My profitability is very much a function of time of day. If I trade too early relative to the New York Open, like in those first few minutes of trading, I have no edge. None, zero, <laughs> I'm totally effed. So I can use that information to change how I enter, what I do during those opening periods. So I'm learning from the data I collect about what I do. I make steady, small improvements, do more of what works, correct what didn't work, keep score again, make some more changes, and that becomes an iterative process. That is deliberate practice. Most traders, at least that I find, don't do deliberate practice well because they're not keeping detailed score. And so they don't have that information to really say, what am I doing well? What needs improvement? And so they can't set the goals to then work on their performance the next day, the next week, the next month, and so forth. Uh, for me, um, it's the same. Deliberate practice is a function of what you're trying to achieve. I mean, deliberate practice, practice is just a fancy way of saying, what are you going to focus on and beat to death until, you, until it's no longer of any consequence? The biggest thing for traders uh, and something that we harp on a lot at Convergent Trading is, as part of our trade right programs, is really identifying errors. Like if, if you can figure out, we, we, we list six errors as something that's a holdover from my prop shop. Um, if you're doing something that you know is impacting, for example, some of the questions like uh, moving a stop to break even or moving a stop to break uh, to early or not obeying a stop or fading your plan, that's an error. Um, FOMO trading is all error trading. Not taking a trade is an error. Uh, as long as, um, as long as uh, this is something that you can identify, then that becomes as part of your goal setting on Sunday night or whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you do it before the big week begins, setting a goal for your expectancy, setting a goal for your um, deliberate practice for the week. There's got to be something every week that you're focusing on getting better at. That's what professionals do, you know? And so deliberate practice, it becomes something like, man, you know, I seem to wait too long. When I see a setup, I seem to wait too long to get in and, it, and then I'm too far from my stop. Okay. So you're taking price risk for more information or man, I'm, I'm jumping the gun in front of my levels instead of waiting for it to round off or for my averages to cross or whatever your method is, now you're exchanging, inf you're taking information risk, meaning you're, you're, you're getting less information to try to get a better price. Like that's something you may want to refine. And so you set a goal that that is my deliberate practice for this week is to just figure out what to do to time this thing right. And then once you achieve that, you will find that your results will reflect it. And then it's, and then you'll run into something else. Hey, every time, you know, I'm trying to size up. I've been trading three lots. I want to go to four. As soon as I go to four, I start to act funky. I start to get afraid. Okay, your practice for this week is going to be building a base of good, a series of good trades, not profitable ones necessarily, but good solid trades then I'll move to four sometime in the day as opposed to starting out with four, which makes me nervous, for example. Uh, so that it's very, very uh, dependent on what it is. Your deliberate practice is that process of working on your mistakes, hangups, imperfections, whatever you want to call it. Very good. Yeah. This is a very short and simple question, uh, but very difficult maybe to answer. Uh, Brahim would like to know, why does he feel fearful when he's in profit and hopeful when in loss? <laughs> Says it doesn't make sense. It's very common. Yeah. yeah, it is actually. Yeah, that's a very good point. Good question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Mike? 
the, uh, hey there. Um, the focus obviously is on profit, right? And so if you have a loss, you're hopeful about making profit. If you have profit, you're fearful of losing profit. But as uh, Murad uh, aptly pointed out, you're getting too attached to the outcome, too attached to profitability. And so you know, when I work with traders, we do a report card and grade ourselves, but we don't grade ourselves on PL. We grade ourselves on process. Performance, yeah. And performance. Uh, yeah, it, it's the process part, doing things the right way. That's what we work on to get that consistency so that we're not overly attached to the numbers. And starting trading early in our careers, trading in simulation, trading small, allows us to focus on process, not get too hung up on the numbers uh, because we're not going to make a ton, we're not going to lose a ton. And that helps us build positive habits. So from my perspective, um, let me ask you, let me ask this, uh, I think you said his name is Ibrahim. If I had to toss a coin, just a fair coin, and with every heads, you get to pass on a slap on your face, and then every tails, I get to slap you across the face, what does it matter? As I'm flipping the coin, what does it matter how you feel about what the coin is doing midair? The fact is the outcome is so random that what you should be doing is just considering that, hey, I, if the guy slaps me, I'm going to be in this position. I'm going to sit in this position. It minimizes the pain and the risk or whatever. It's a weird analogy, I know. But to me, why are you so attached to a random... No matter what you do, and Mark Douglas did tons of work with this, and you are experiencing it every day. You have no control over the outcome that the market provides. You have zero control. All you control as part of the process is how much am I willing to chip in to get a roll of the roulette wheel? That's your stop. What it pays out is up to the market. And so why would you want to be attached to making sure that every trade is a winner? It doesn't work that way. There are people who will sit there all day long and will only put on a trade when they believe they've got everything that's needed for this particular trade to be a winner. Guess what happens when it doesn't work? They're so committed to the trade that they'll move their stop, they'll give it more room, a five point loss turns into a 20 point loss turns into a broker calling you to liquidate your account, you know, because you're so attached to an outcome. This is much like shooting arrows at a, at a, at a board. You're, you're doing the best you can, but once you let go of that arrow, how you feel about its flight doesn't matter. It's going to land where it's going to land. Your process is to think of what am I risking to find out how well I'm going to do on the next shot. That's it. So this, I, it's, don't, I'm not talking about muting your emotions or suppressing emotions because that's ridiculous. What I'm talking about is taking the process, and this is what professionals, in my experience, do. Take the process, understand the process, understand its parts, execute and just let it do what it needs to do, period. Your focus is to just execute. And there is no way to control what happens next. You know, a tweet comes out from a president and it turns things. That, that's not something you can plan for. You can't study that out of the data set. So the idea is to just let the market do what it's got to do. And you do what you've got to do. Just risk as little as possible of your account, a reasonable amount of your account, to catch whatever trend you're trading on within your time frame, All you can do as a trader, you cannot control what happens next. So if you're fearful and so on, acknowledge, don't suppress the emotion, don't pretend it's not there, acknowledge that it's there, just don't act on it. So it's a lot of awareness, like, oh my God, I'm getting nervous, man, I wanna touch that mouse, I wanna close this trade, I wanna move my stop. Fine, 
have that conversation with yourself. Just don't touch the damn mouse. Let the plan work. And it's so hard for people to separate the strong emotion that comes from trading from the action. Both can coexist. You can have a lot of emotions, but you're disciplined enough to know I've got to stick with my process. Otherwise, I'm introducing another error into my into the, the data set that I'm creating that then I'll have to fight to work out. So just let it be. If you don't believe in your process, then you need to go back and take Dr. Steenbarger's advice, go back to your simulator and do a thousand more trades or whatever it takes for you to understand that, hey, you know, it's just one drop in this big bucket of water. It should not raise or lower the level that much unless I insist on making this one drop the whole world to me. And that's what happens a lot because the emotions are kind of bubbling up. So just, just be aware of that. Uh, Maury, can I jump in there? I like your, uh, your metaphor there, the uh, bucket of water, the drop of the bucket of water. Uh, one uh, uh, related point that I make uh, in uh, my books is that a great way of not overreacting emotionally to our trading is to have things in your life that are more important to you than p and mm. You know, especially the younger traders, they tell me how they have a passion for trading and that's all they do and they're spending all their time. <laughs> that's called an impoverished lifestyle. That, that, that's, uh, that's not a formula for peak performance. But when you have things in your life that are more important to you than markets, more important to you than PL, it puts things in perspective. It's then one drop in the bucket, as you say, Morad, that uh, if I have a marriage of 37 years, which I have, if I have five kids and I've got seven grandkids and I've got four rescue cats, and I've got a career as a psychologist and I have many different spiritual interests uh, that I've uh, also written about. Wow, okay, so if a trade doesn't work out, big effing deal. I mean, you know, like, you know, so, I mean, it's disappointing and you wanna learn from it, but it, it's not your whole world. Your ego is not, attached to that. One of the things, uh, if you go to my blog site, the um, Trader Feed, T-R-A-D-E-R-F-E-E-D, you'll see a link to a book that I wrote. And I wrote it on a blog platform so that it would be free. Anyone can just download it. And uh, it's called Radical Renewal. And you can click on that. But it's about not the psychology of trading, but the spirituality of trading. And the thesis is that good trading, great trading, comes from the soul, not the ego. It's when we get our egos attached to what we're doing that suddenly we have these emotional reactions. When we trade from the soul, we have a relationship with markets and we're listening to markets and we can hear what they're saying and how they're behaving and we can respond just like we would in an intimate relationship. That's a different way of making decisions and it's a way that avoids many of these problems that occur because trading becomes too important to us. Yeah, good point to keep things in perspective. Yeah, I think it's so important. Uh, yeah, yeah, but he still doesn't have the brand new Bentley SUV, so he's not <laughs> worth anything to anyone else on Twitter or anywhere else. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely, absolutely. But you know what? We're doing a 10-bedroom home in August and flying in all the kids and grandkids, and we're going to get together for the first time, and that is going to be so meaningful. And so that's the stuff that sustains you. That's the stuff from the soul and uh, the ups and downs of markets and, and so forth. It really puts those in perspective. Hmm. Very good. Very good. 
Uh, you guys got time for a few more? We're, we're, we're buttoning up against uh, an hour now, but if you've got time, I've got questions. Well, yeah, why don't we 30 do 30 more minutes. Yeah, okay. you're okay. You're okay for a while. Yeah, yeah. So why don't we do a few more? Because I know there are quite a few good questions. I, I scan through the Q and A. Uh, you know what, Doc? If you want to peel one of those off, there, feel free. Well, some dude asked a question. His name is Big Mike. Do you know that guy? <laughs> I've heard of that guy. I, I don't. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, he asked a question about. He was talking about how. Uh, psychology is so important to trading and how do we get traders to take it seriously? Mm. Uh, and uh, I think it's a good question that uh, part of training ourselves to be successful as traders is training ourselves to be in the right performance mindset. And that's why you see professional athletes, for instance, doing different things to make sure that they're in the zone and working on their mindset. And whether it's through meditation to improve your focus, whether it's doing physical exercise to stay energized and alert, building a lifestyle that keeps you in peak performance mode is just as important as studying markets and learning from markets. Because if you're not in the right mindset, you won't be able to make proper use of what you're learning during that study. Very interesting that it would be all encompassing, not just trading or aspects of performance trading or performance and other aspects of life, but just having a well-rounded approach to your entire life contribute to your trading success. Absolutely. You know, in any area of performance, you want to be in a mind state where you your your head is clear and where you can see things well and make good decisions. And uh, trading is just one example of that. What is what is some uh, what are some techniques or processes have you recommended Dr. Steenbarger, to achieve a calm, quiet mind and, and so on. Uh, do you, did you develop anything or do you recommend something for people who just feel like there's so much noise going on uh, as they're sitting in front of the markets or sitting in front of anything? Yeah, yeah. And uh, a couple of ideas in that respect. And I have uh, something on that three minute trading coach video series about this topic also. Uh, many traders I work with will use apps like Headspace to train themselves not only to relax, but to meditate and focus. One of the things I wrote about is using a device, um, well, you can see by yeah, Fitbit uh, uh, Sense device um, that looks at galvanic skin response, your electrodermal response, uh, so it's measuring your stress levels. Uh, there's also a device that goes around the head that measures brain waves called Muse, M-U-S-E. And I use that. And you can literally go through routines and train yourself to keep your stress level low. And you see the feedback right on your watch or you get the feedback right from this Muse device. It's called biofeedback. And it's a training set of tools for learning how to master your mindset. And so I know what I need to do to stay focused with that news device, for instance. And so I can take a quick break during trading or a quick break during a stressful time in my day-to-day -day life, really focus myself and then go back to what I was doing. So there are some apps that work this way. There are biofeedback devices that work this way that literally train us to be quote unquote in the zone. Right. Very interesting. Uh, let's see here. I thought this was pretty interesting by Josh. Josh says, uh, how do you refine your trading until you are operating at the right balance of aggression and caution? He said that it seems like after losses, he's so risk averse that uh, he's overly cautious and not pulling the trigger when his plan tells him to. 
uh, or when the probabilities are in his favor. And when he's impulsive, he takes trades outside of the plan and then falls back to being overly cautious. Uh, how, do, how can he know in the moment that he's operating at the right balance? Because there's definitely times when he can't distinguish the difference. You want me to go? I'll take that. I'll take Good. that. Go for it, man. Go. <laughs> um, PNL. He's trading for PNL. That's yeah. all. It, does it matter? Does it matter what's going on when you're just following a process? You're just following a process. It's, you know, passing on a passing on a trade setup that's in your plan. Error. Taking trades impulsively because the market's more volatile that are outside of your plan. Error. These are errors. These are not in your plan. Think of yourself as a soldier. Somebody's giving you orders. Somebody outside of yourself, in this case, is giving you orders, and you are disobeying these orders. Why are you disobeying these orders? What are the consequences if you did that in the military, right? You'll be court-martialed. But with us, as individual traders, we don't have that accountability, and that's why accountability is huge for me, because you now have to account for doing that. And it's because, not because you lost money. I couldn't care less if you lost, well, I care that you lost money for the firm. But the question is, did you lose money doing what you're supposed to, or did you lose money chasing some big rip that wasn't at all a part of your plan? So how aggressive you are and how laid back your trading really are a function of what the market is generating in terms of signals. Most of the time, it's pretty boring, right? It's just kind of waiting around for something to happen. And then now you're in action. And then it's pretty boring waiting around for it to start kind of moving in your direction or stopping you out or whatever. So you're when you're uh, deciding to be selective with those trades, you're essentially disobeying your process and you're introducing randomness into the data set. Randomness in your data set, whether you're in a medical school and you're a professor and whatever, having trying to troubleshoot random behavior is really very difficult. But if a process is broken, we can find out where that is and make adjustments. And throughout your trading career, you will be making adjustments to your trading plan. I mean, go to trader feed uh, Dr. Steen Barter's uh, blog, I, I think I started reading it. Heck, it must have been around for 20 years now. Uh, I started reading it way back. And you can see, you can see Dr. Steen Barter kind of bringing new things, new ideas in and looking at certain things. And that's what you have to do. You're constantly developing. But once it's set in your plan, you have to follow it religiously. So you're really trading for PL because it's not up to you to figure out which trades are gonna work, which setups are gonna work and which are not. It's not up to you. How can you, you, you can't see the future. So the idea is you just take them as they come, but if you hit your limits or if you're halfway to your daily loss limit or something, it's time for you to step back. There's a streak there that needs to be broken. You need to step away, take your break or just stop. But otherwise, it's like, you know, I get this question, hey, um, I have a down limit for the day. Should I have an up limit for the day? You know, I make 300 bucks. Should I stop? I don't know. What's, where are you? What's your emotional capital like? Because if, if, if you can tr execute on your plan without overthinking it, then there's no reason you should stop. You should just keep taking the next setup and the next setup and the next setup. But if you're working on raising emotional capital and raising your confidence, then it might be a good idea to have an upper limit for a streak of day so you can feel like, okay, I've got some, I can relax now, I've got some cushion or whatever. It's the little tricks we play with ourselves. But overall, you're paying it too much attention to PL. That's what kills most people, causes random behaviors like you're experiencing. Yeah, if I can just jump in, I, I agree with that point. And you know what the psychology research tells us is that we perform best when we are in what is called the flow state, when we are totally absorbed with what we're doing. How can we be totally absorbed in markets if we're focused, as you say, Morad, on our P&L, if we're focused on our sizing? Should I take a smaller size, a larger size? 
you're thinking about you. It's back to that ego thing. You're thinking about you. You're not totally absorbed in the market. You're not focused on the market. So I, I know in my own trading, some people say, well, size, the high conviction trades this way and lower conviction trades that way. I only want to trade if I have a lot of confidence in the idea and if I've really seen it and worked with it. And so the sizing is automatic. I have an automatic size that I've put on that with a degree of risk that I can tolerate. And so it's not something I think about. It's pre-wired. And that allows me to be in that zone, to be focused on the market rather than focused on, should I make more? Should I make less? Should I be bigger, smaller? It's not about me. Now it's about seeing the market. Very interesting. Oh, here's one. Uh, Adam Smith uh, would like to know, why do so few retail traders succeed becoming profitable versus the prop trading environment? What's different about it? Trading techniques, psychology, motivation, other items. Why do prop traders work on the process and retail traders seem to not be able to do it? I'll, I'll definitely take that. There are a number of prop firms where people fail consistently. Mm. And, and, been there, done that, I've seen those. Uh, it's not about being a prop firm or being an independent trader. It's about going through a structured learning process. And some prop firms and some hedge funds have a structure, have structured learning processes. It, and they have a higher success rate with people making money in trading. The number one predictor of success, this is true in trading, but it's true in other fields as well. The number one predictor of success is mentoring. Mm -hmm. That if you learn at the side of an experienced person, this is why in medical school, you know, when you're a medical student, you learn at the bedside, you are following a, a, a resident physician, an, an attending physician, you're observing what they're doing, you're asking them questions, you learn from mentors. Why individual traders often don't succeed? They don't have mentors. They don't have someone who they can truly follow minute by minute, day by day, and really absorb the lessons. And I think at some prop firms that's available, not all. Yeah, so my take on this is um, that statistic, which I find incredibly annoying, 90% of traders uh, fail, but it's crap in, crap out. 90% define a trader. Is it somebody who opened a trading account? Because in general, the studies that have been done that have been cited to me are from, you know, interactive brokers account that deposited a certain amount and then ended up with less money within a certain period of time or whatever. But you know what? 99% of the people who try to, to, to do heart surgery without prior training are going to fail or whatever with disastrous results for the patient. It's just the, the key element in a prop environment that really is missing for the online individual trader is the the accountability side of things mentoring is huge right just being able to follow someone you know this guy trades you know he's been here a while he or she has been here a while they're making money and it gives you a certain level of confidence now can you download what they're doing and copy it exactly and become profitable from that no but the fact that you, you can see and believe that this is doable combined with the ability to ask questions and cut that learning curve, you know, 80%. Um, but the key element is accountability in prop that does not exist outside of prop. Your seat is, somewhat, is something that is a, commo a hot commodity for that firm. You're costing money when you're not doing what you're supposed to do, when you're wasting time. When you're not doing your homework, you're costing somebody money. They could have someone in your seat who can make them profitable. Um, and so to me, that's the big thing. Find an accountability partner if you cannot be a part of a prop sh a shop. Uh, prop shops are difficult to come by. True prop shops are difficult to come by these days. 
but overall create accountability, create and have it with someone who is trading a similar product in a similar time frame in a similar time zone and make yourself accountable. You'll find results, um, dramatically better results because we've seen this at Convergent. I have to say past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results, but we've seen this improvement over time when people have to answer to why they did what they did, mm. right? You have to explain yourself and that's definitely, definitely alive and well in a prop shop that doesn't exist in someone who's trading their own account. Um, mentoring is a big piece, but I think accountability and having an accountability journal, having a scorecard is huge. We have a scoring system where you, it's not about p &L, It's about from, from one to 10, how is your prep today? From one to 10, how's your execu execution? From one to 10, how is your market alignment? That's what's called trade, you know, being in the zone. You, you need to rate those every day. Have, did you do your homework? Did you not? These are things that then show up over time and your PL kind of correlates with this. So it's the structure that is missing for the online trader versus the prop environment. And I, I came into a prop environment when I first moved to Chicago. I was in the board of trade in a brand new prop shop that went under um, within, what is it, a year and a half or two years because it just can, had garbage for structure. It's just a waste of money. But when I started my shop, one of the key elements was, no, I'm putting in a lot of risk capital here. I want it to happen a certain way. And you're going to be accountable to me. And that helps people rise to that level. Whereas an individual who's self-accounting can always explain away what they're doing. We're masters as human beings. We're masters at explaining nonsense to ourselves and getting away with it. Um, so these are some of the reasons. Additionally, the infrastructure, cost structure, um, just general support, things like that also have an impact, I think, in prop versus independent trader. Yeah, definitely not having that sort of framework in place uh, makes it a lot more difficult for uh, people who are just doing it on their own, for sure. Yeah, I've struggled with that for years. Well, guys, I think uh, we're getting close here. And I know, Morad, you got to get out of here pretty quick. I think we've got time for one more. And I think this one's pretty good. Uh, Bill would like to know, what tips do you have when you're feeling like you're on top of the world and everything is going your way? He finds that uh, he needs to step away when he gets too confident from many successful trades, similar to stepping away when noticing your psychology isn't in the right spot. Uh, lucky, luckily, he says he can only count on one hand uh, the number of times that he blew up you know, weeks or even months where the profit from becoming too confident and revenge trading after losers. But, uh, you know, how do you, how do you counter that euphoria or that excessive confidence when things are really rolling and, and you're just almost asking for it? That's a super, super question. And, and I know myself from my own trading uh, that it's as soon as I start to feel like, I think I got this. <laughs> I'm ready to take a, quite a rip. Um, because it's easy for confidence to become overconfidence. And so with the folks I work with, uh, and this includes the portfolio managers, we, we look at winning and period streaks of winning as just as much a risk factor to decision-making as streaks of losing. And so after a period of winning, Someone will say, I'm feeling good. I really am seeing an opportunity. I think this market could go a lot higher. And I'm, I want to be long, real size here. And so my question becomes, let's do a visualization exercise and visualize that this is January 1 and you're just starting the year. You're at zero p &L. Would you be taking this trade? And would you be taking it in the size that you're considering? And often when they put themselves in that mindset, maybe they would take the trade if it's a high confidence view, but they wouldn't be over their skis with confidence. Is it a trade you would take if you were down money on the year? Well, if it's a really good idea, yes, you would have to take it, but you certainly, again, would not get over your skis with the sizing. And so, by doing that kind of reflection. 
you can figure out what is confidence and what might be overconfidence. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that when you're feeling euphoric, I think if you went through my Twitter feed, which is probably too long to go through, but when people say, hey, man, I'm rocking it, it's been amazing, my immediate response is watch your risk. Like become, pull out that risk plan, read it again, <laughs> become staunchly aware of what your controls are uh, for a blow up because it's true. And I've seen this with myself and my own traders. You know, when somebody starts to really feel like they're on top of the world, that's when you get into your risk screen and cut their size and then send them an email later in the evening telling them, hey, I'm cutting your size in half for the next few days just to kind of have you cool off. It's exactly the point that uh, Dr. Steenbarger has just made. It's just as risky to be in that euphoric state as it is to be in a very, very bad rough patch. Um, your people tend to start throwing away their plan or moving away from their plan and start really looking at what they can achieve. You know, I had a great day today. I could have bought a car with my PL today. I want to buy a house with my PL tomorrow. They start to project their PL and so on. You have to, again, I know I sound like a broken record. You have to go back to your process. It is your process that is your seatbelt when you're driving fast. It is your process that's keeping you in your seat when things go wrong and is is likely to take you through the rough patches. It is unsexy, um, but it is what's what keeps a career long. I've been trading for, all, for 21 years this year, and it's I could have blown up many times, but I have not. It's because I know that, hey, I, this isn't going to help me to try to recover money. What's going to help me is to try to figure out what I'm doing wrong and to get back in line with what my view of the market is the goal is to always find the zone to always you know to me the best metaphor analogy i don't know what it is for trading is surfing we don't create the waves we don't do anything to initiate the energy that carries us back to shore our job is just to be out there to be ready to paddle to be ready to stand on our board and ride it for what it's got i cannot determine how big a wave it's going to be but it's setting up and I have to be on it and I have to take it. I don't get to dictate that the market should give me a wave and I don't get to pass up waves just because, hey, I, I don't think it's going to be a big one because I don't really know. So just stay in that zone, stay in the, in the space of just being ready to take the correct action no matter what. Now, if you've had a hot streak, the, the way I would suggest increasing your size, which I, I don't think anybody's asked here, the way I'd suggest you increase your size is don't double your size because you feel hot or you have a huge amount of confidence. As soon as you earn the full initial margin of the next contract, add it because the, the risk on the account remains the same. So you've taken your account from $5,000 for a one lot to $10,000 for a two lot. You can't trade that third lot until you've actually built up to 15 grand because at the end of the day, the risk of ruin stays the same. So don't increase your size because you feel like you've dominant, you're on top of the world. Increase your size because your account can sustain it so that the overall risk remains the same because risk is parabolic as profits are parabolic. And so when you start to pile on this huge size, because you, you can, this is why I think $500 margins are crazy, um, you know, earn, earn the next contract. And that's your goal. Uh, you can go like Dr. Steenbarger on these, on these funds and go with breadth in growth. Like a fund can only trade so big. So they start to go and look at other markets, other products. As a trader, you can go vertical and just, continue to add size. And that's what we do in prop. We press someone to become an expert in their product and look to get them to up their size to a level that correlates with their uh, emotional capital or risk tolerance. Uh, so that's your goal. It's not, hey, I feel great today. So I'm going to just pile on, you know, 10 times the size. No, 
You're putting on more size because your account can sustain it. And there is nothing else that dictates or allows you to do that except for your account size. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, we're about out of time, but I definitely wanted to thank you both for joining us here today. Through thick and thin, we made it one way or another. <laughs> we're here. We're here. A lot of emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Really appreciate it. Really do. Uh, let's get together and do it again sometime. Good times. That's a pleasure to be here with Dr. Steenbarger. And I just, in honor of his four cats, I wanted to say, oh, oh right. <laughs> that I'm, that I'm with you. Yeah, I'm with you. Brett, do you need two more? <laughs> no, no, no more cats. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so all of ours are rescues. And that was Sophie who appeared in the video. And she was reminding me, she was saying, dude, come on, it's happy hour already. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah. about that time for sure. Yeah. Well, it's an, it's an honor to be here with you, Dr. Steenbarger. We never, we've crossed paths here and there, but we've never done anything together. It's a pleasure yeah. to be on and with I've you enjoyed and learn from you. With you, Brad, and thank you for setting this up, Shane. Thank uh, Mike for us. Um, great stuff. And uh, have a good night. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Okay. All righty, okay. folks, that about wraps it up. Uh, be sure to join us for our next event, uh, Tuesday, April 6th. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Bruce Pringle of Bookmap and covering iceberg indicators and market by order data. And, and also, don't please, I'm sorry, please don't forget, hit that like button on YouTube. Uh, head on over to Futures.io to join up for free. Uh, we, I, there's a bunch of questions that didn't get answered, so I'm going to make it my business uh, to get those over on the uh, webinar thread and hopefully we can get some answers for you. Uh, you can continue the conversation there. I thank you, everybody, for joining us once again, and trade well.